Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today to continue reading Journey to the River Sea by Eva Abotson. The illustrations in this book are by Kevin Hawks, and this book was published by uh, Puffin Books. We're gonna pick up where we left off with chapter seven, right after the disastrous play where Clovis's voice cracked in the middle of an important speech and Maya, uh, who had snuck into the, um, the show, was probably uh, gonna be in some trouble, as we'll see. Chapter seven. For two days after the matinee, Maya was in disgrace. I couldn't believe my eyes, said Mrs. Carter, glaring at her over a dollop of macaroni cheese, so solid that she was cutting it with a knife. A girl in my care creeping out secretly, going backstage and looking like a ragamuffin. The girls told me they thought they'd seen you on the way out, but I didn't believe it. We told you, Mama, said Beatrice, smirking. She stuck on that actor boy with the bass voice. And then they both started doing invitations of Clovis saying, well, I have to stop being your little boy in a deep growly voice and laughing. Oh, it was so funny. I thought I was going to die. At first, Maya had tried to defend Clovis and make them see what mishaps had meant to him, what the mishap had meant to him. But she soon gave up. Making the twins imagine the feelings of anyone except themselves was a waste of time. Instead, Maya had to put up with Mrs. Carter's threats to send her back to England. Maya had told her that she had gone to Manus on a boat ferrying rubber down river, and Mrs. Carter did not understand why she had not been murdered and thrown overboard. As for Miss Minton, I'm afraid she is not really fit to have charge of young girls. She'll have to replace her as soon as I have found someone suitable. In the evening, when Miss Minton came to hear her read, Maya said, I am not staying here without you. I shall write to Mr. Murray. I think you will find at the salary the Carters are paying me, it might take a little while to find someone else, said Miss Mitten dryly. She picked up Maya's hairbrush. Don't tell me you're doing a hundred strokes at night because I don't believe you. I've told you again and again that you must look after your hair. She brushed fiercely for a while and then said, do you want to go back, Maya, back to England? I did, she said, thinking about it. The twins are so awful and there seemed no point at being here shut up in this house, but not now. I don't want to go now because I've seen that it is there, what I thought was there. Miss Minton waited. I mean, the forest, the river, the Amazon, everything I thought of before I came, and the people who live in it and know about it. Then she told Miss Minton about the boy who had taken her into Manus. He didn't speak English, but he had such a listening face. I couldn't believe he didn't understand everything I said. Oh, Minty, it was such a wonderful journey, like floating through a drowned forest. You can't believe it's the same world, world as the Carters live in. It isn't, said Miss Mitten. People make their own worlds. I wish I could find him again. And then I will find him again if they don't send me away. They won't send you away, said Miss Mitten. Mrs. Carter was already waiting greedily for the next month's allowance for Maya from the bank in Manus. However, it seems to me we must find a way of getting you out of doors. She wrinkled her formidable forehead. I think a disease might be best. Yes, yeah, something that makes it necessary for you to go out and breathe fresh air. Even damp air. Let me think. What about uh, pulmonary spasms? Maya stared at her. I've never heard of them. Well, no, I've just made them up. Well, tell Mrs. Carter that you're, if your lungs get dry from the disinfectant indoors, you'll have spasms. You know what they are, don't you? Yes, sort of twitching and convulsions. Yes, convulsions will do. Mrs. Carter won't like them. But I may not always be able to go out with you, so please understand that I am trusting you to stay close to the house and be sensible, which you do not seem to have been. Yes, I will, honestly. But she could try to make friends with the native people in the huts. She could find out who sang that lullaby and ask them about the person who had whistled blow the wind southerly on her first night. They might even know who her rescuer had been so that she could at least thank, you, thank him properly. But Maya had not forgotten about her promise to help Clovis. He wants to stow away on a boat to England, but he's sure to get caught, don't you think? She asked Miss Mitten. Certain to, said the governess. Fortunately, the next boat to England doesn't leave for two weeks. Do you think Mr. Murray would be willing to pay his passage? He could take it out of my pocket money. I doubt you'd see any pocket money for the rest of your life if you did that. But he might, persisted Maya. Could I send him a cable? 
they don't take very long, do they? They sort of snake along the sea. He could arrange the, with the shipping company in Manus for Clovis to pick up a ticket, couldn't he? My father was always doing things like that. He could, said Miss Mitten, but she doubted very much whether Maya's guardian would trouble himself about a stranded actor. But she did not stand in Maya's way. Maya copied out a message to Mr. Murray and gave it to Mr. Carter to take to the post office with enough money to send it. Then she settled down to wait for a reply. Mrs. Carter was not pleased about the pulmonary spasms. She had never heard of them and said so. She did not want Maya wandering up, out, about, side, about outside by herself. I shall expect you to accompany her whenever possible, she said to Miss Mitten, and to make up the lesson time with the twins out of your free periods. Miss Mitten could have said, what free periods, but she did not. But she was quite right in thinking that, while she could not bring herself to be nice to Maya, Mrs. Carter dreaded losing her. Since Maya came, they had been able to pay the bill for the dressmaker, the piano lessons, and the dancing class. Next month, they might even be able to pay some of the rubber gatherers. Not their full wages, but enough to stop them running back to the forest. So Maya was allowed to go outside for her midday break, and again after tea. She was not allowed to go out in the evening, but she did go anyway. Once she had pushed back the heavy bolt on her door, she left it open. She was careful not to go too near the huts of the native people without being asked, but when she met anyone, she smiled and greeted them. Then on the third night, she was walking along the river beside a grove of dyewood trees when she saw a small shape run out of the darkness towards her. It was dusk and she had no idea what it could be. And for a moment, she was frightened. There were so many animals still that she knew nothing about. Maya looked down and laughed. The strange animal was a baby, the baby that she had seen being carried by the Portuguese girl. It had only just escaped and was enjoying its freedom, but the river was nearby. Maya picked it up. The baby kicked and struggled, but she held it firmly and began to make her way back towards the huts. Oh, hush, she said. Don't make such a fuss. And she began to hum the lullaby that she had heard the native people singing. She didn't know the words, but the tune quieted the baby, and he stopped wriggling and let his head fall against her shoulder. As she neared the middle hut, she saw three people standing outside the door staring at her, Tappy, Furo, and the old woman with the long gray hair. Then Tappy ran to the next hut, and the Portuguese girl, uh, Conchita, came out and rushed up to Maya, seizing the baby and letting off a torrent of words. She had left him asleep on his mat, and he must have woken while she was out in the back getting water. He is a terror. He is wickedness beyond belief. Now that she had handed over the baby, Maya turned to go, but this was not allowed. The sullen silkiness of the Carter servants had vanished. Tappy led her into the hut. The old lady brought coffee and nuts. Fruit was offered and little cakes. A party was brewing up. You sang him good, said the baby's mother and nodded. Where did you learn our song? From my window, said Maya, pointing back to the house. But I don't know the words. It was the old woman, Lila, who was the singer, and she sang it now for Maya. Is it a lullaby? She asked, pretending to go to sleep, and Lila said it was a song about love and pain, like so many songs, but she always sang babies to sleep with it. She had been a nurse to many children, European ones also, she told her. They knew and understood far more English than they admitted to the Carters, and they spoke with their hands and their eyes. Maya let the, met the little white dog, the parrot sat on her shoulder, and they had a tame gecko that lived in a potted palm in the window. Every time her cup was empty or her plate, it was filled again. She had never met such friendliness. These native people lived the kind of life that she had imagined for the twins before she came. They knew in a, um, after that she slipped in to see them whenever she could. The old lady, who was Firo's aunt, taught her other songs, songs that the African slaves had, that had been brought over when they came to work in the sugar plantations had taught, songs that she had learned from her Portuguese employers when she was a nursemaid in Manus. They showed her the end hut, the one where the rubber gatherers had slept, but which was now empty because the men had slept back in the forest and Mr. Carter hadn't paid them for three whole months. But nobody knew the North Country tune that she had heard whistled on the first day, nor could they tell her anything about the boy who had taken her to Manus. There were many such boys on the rivers, they said, and Maya began to feel that she would never see her rescuer again. Several days had passed since the disaster of the matinee, and in the Hotel Paradiso, things were going badly. The Goodleys had called a meeting in their bedroom to decide what to do, but as usual, they started by nagging Clovis. You think you could have waited another week before you started honking like an old grandfather, said Mrs. Goodley. 
You realize you've turned us into the laughing stock, said Nancy goodly. After all we've done for you, making you a star. Clovis hung his head. He was crouched on a dirty footstool, clutching his stomach, which was heaving after the parody so breakfast of bean stew and fish bones, and he was covered in bites because the hotel sheets were crawling with bed bugs. It was all his fault, he knew that, and now even more things were going wrong. The banana boat had come in from Bellum the night before, and the captain had told the manager of the Paradiso that the company had left there without paying their hotel bill. Since the men, the manager shot out of his office whenever any of the actors came past, asking for money and threatening to take their clothes and belongings if they didn't pay. They tried to put on a funny play that Mr. Goodley had written instead of Fauntleroy, but it wasn't funny and it had to be pulled out. Now not only the hotel, but the theater was losing money, and management was threatening to cancel the second week of their booking. They were due to go on to Colombia and Peru, but how? Perhaps you could steal out of the hotel one by one at night and hire a van? Suggested the old actor with the flashing teeth. Hire a van with what? Mr. Goodley sneered. Pebbles? Coconut shells? Clovis stopped listening. He felt as wretched as he ever had felt and frightened, too. Whatever was going to happen to him and everyone else. He could see himself staring into the dark pit of the theater and listening to that awful tittering that had started everyone off. Two girls, high-pitched and cruel. One thing was certain, no one was going to want him to get on stage again. Only Maya was still his friend. She'd promised to help him. She said that there was something that they could do, and he trusted Maya as he trusted no one else. The loud, angry voices voices clashed over his head. The room was sweltering. A centipede fell from the ceiling at his feet. Downstairs, someone opened a door and the smell of the dreaded bean stew came up and hit him. He couldn't face it again. He couldn't face any of it. Then suddenly he sat up very straight. He didn't have to face it now that he wasn't acting anymore. He knew where Maya lived and Miss Minton, a few miles up the river to the north. The twins would like to see him, Maya had said on the boat, and Clovis saw them now, welcoming in kind. If yes, that's what he'd do, he'd go and find Maya. He had a few coins still. Someone would take him up the river. And once he was with Maya and Miss Mitten, everything would be all right. They would help him get to home. Maya and Miss Mitten together could do anything. Miss Mitten's afternoon off fell two days later. She was going to Manus, and Maya hoped that she would ask her to go with, but she didn't. She was going to see if there was a reply yet from Mr. Murray, but after that she had business to attend to, she said. Since the Carters were going into the town to visit the only family in Manus with whom they were still in speaking terms, they could hardly help offering her a place in the launch. Where is Furo? asked Mrs. Carter as one of the other native people waited by the boat. Sick, said the man, letting his knees go soft and miming a fever. Oh, they really are impossible, these people, said Mrs. Carter angrily. They sight this thing and they stay off work. Maya waved them off. Then she was into the sitting room and opening the piano. It was almost impossible to practice when the Carters were at home. She started on her scales and arpeggios, but sooner than she should have done, she began to play the Chopin ballad she'd been learning in, New in London. She was so absorbed that at first she did not see Furo beckoning to her outside the window. He did not seem to be in the least bit sick. He looked, in fact, rather pleased and excited. Come, he said, making signs that she was to be quiet. Maya followed him. She was puzzled. During the day, the Indian people always ignored her. It was only at night that they showed her their true selves. Tappy and old Lila were standing by the door of their hut, smiling, but they said nothing, and Maya followed Furo to the creek where she had found the creek she had found on the day that she tried to go to Manus. By the wood bridge, a shabby dugout was moored. It was the one that Furo used to go fishing in the evening. In, he said, holding up a hand. She hesitated for only a moment, but then obeyed him. They traveled down a number of twisting rivers. Sometimes Maya thought that she had been there before. Sometimes everything looked different. Whenever she tried to question Furo, he shook his head, but he went on looking pleased. No one could have been more different from the surly boatman who had brought them to the Carters in the first place. They paddled down a side stream, and now Maya did feel uneasy, because Furo took out a square piece of cloth, put it over his own eyes to show her what she was to do, and then over Maya's. Put on, he said, and when she shook her head, repeated it, leaning forward to tie the blindfold over her eyes. She began to be frightened. The boat eased slowly forward. She heard rushes making a dry sound against the side of the canoe and felt branches brushing her arms. Then the boat surged forward and Furo leaned forward to unbind her eyes. They were in a still lagoon of clear blue water, shielded from the outside by a ring of great trees. The only entrance, the passage to the rushes, seemed to have closed behind them. They might have been alone in the world. 
but it was not the secrecy of the lake that held Maya spellbound. It was the beauty. The sheltering trees leaned over the water. There was a bank of golden sand on which a turtle slept. Untroubled by the boat, clumps of yellow and pink lotus flowers swayed in the water, their buds open to the sun. Hummingbirds clustered in an ever-changing whirl of color around feeding bottles nailed to a branch. On the far side of the, the lagoon, in the shade of two big cottonwoods, was a, neat wood, a neatly built wooden hut, and in front of it, a narrow wooden jetty built over the lake. A small launch with a raked smokestack and the litter's Arabella painted on the side rode at anchor nearby, and made fast alongside it was a canoe which Maya recognized. But she did not at first recognize the boy who stood outside of the hut, waiting uh, quietly. He seemed to be the native boy who had taken her to Manus, but his jet black hair was gone, and so had the headband and the red paint. With his own fine brown hair, he looked like any European boy who has lived a long time in the sun. Except that he didn't. He looked like no boy Maya had ever seen, sitting so still, not waving or shouting instructions, just being there. And the dog that stood beside him was unlike any other dog also. A thin dog, the color of dark sand. He knew when to bark and when to be silent. And as their canoe drew up alongside of the wooden platform, he permitted himself only half a wave of his tail. The, boat, the boy stretched out his hand and Maya jumped out. I've decided to trust you, he said in English. She had known before he had spoke. Now she was sure. Maya looked into his eyes. You can do that, she said seriously. I wouldn't betray you to the crows, not for the world. The crows? <laughs> yes, that is the right name for them. So you know who I am. Here's a picture of the boy and his dog, the jetty and the hut. Your Bernard Tra Tavner's son, the boy who Professor Glastonbury said didn't exist, but I don't know your first name. It's Finn, and you're Maya. You sing beautifully, but you don't like beetroot and sums. Maya stared at him. How do you know all that? The people tell me. They see everything. Old Lila used to be my nurse when I was a baby. I go and talk to them sometimes least I used to before the crows came, but only at night. The Carters have never seen me, and they never will. His voice, when he spoke of the Carters, was suddenly full of hatred. It was you then, said Maya. It was you who whistled, blow the wind southerly, the first night I came. It was such a comfort. Finn turned and said a few quick words to Furo in his own language. I'll fetch you in a couple of hours, he said. Come on, I'll show you everything, and then I'll tell you why I sent for you. He grinned and then pulled himself up. I mean, why I wanted you to come. When Furo disappeared through the narrow channel of rushes, the silence seemed overwhelming. Yet she heard the noise of the water lapping the Arabella, the word of the hummingbird's wings, the dog yawning. It was as though sounds had been freshly invented in this secret place. Finn led her to the door of the hut. My father built it, and we lived here whenever we weren't away on collecting trips. I still can't believe he isn't coming back, though it's four months since he was drowned. Do you see him sometimes, Maya asked. And as he turned sharply because she seemed to have read his thoughts, I see mine, my father, not a ghost or an apparition, just him. Yes, it's that exactly. Often he's showing me something, a new insect or a plant. Mine shows me things too, little bits of pottery, shards. He was an archaeologist. Mine was a naturalist. He collected over a hundred new species. I know, I saw some of the things in the museum. You must be proud of him. Yes, maybe that's the point of father's. They're the people who show you things. The hut was just as Bernard Taverner had left it when he went out with a native friend to look for the blue water lily, whose leaves were used as a painkiller. His collecting boxes and specimen jars, his plant press and dis dissecting kit and microscope were all stacked neatly on his work table. His carpentry tools were hung carefully on the wooden wall. On the other side of the hut was a tackle for the boat. The khaki sheet still lay folded on his hammock as though he expected to return to sleep that night and on shelves made from palmwood planks were rows of old books, books on natural history, books on exploration, and all the well-known classics. But the book that lay open on the table with a marker was Caesar's Gaelic Wars in Latin, and as he looked at it, Finn sighed. He made me promise to go on with Latin, whatever happened. He said that there is nothing like it for sharpening the mind, but it is difficult on one's own. Yes, Maya nodded, everything is difficult on one's own. But she thought she'd never seen a place she liked more. The hut was spotlessly clean with a slight smell of wood smoke and the watery scent of the reeds coming in through the window. 
There was a small oil stove and a sink, but she could see that most of the boy cooked outside on the stone fireplace, built on a spit of land that ran between the hut and the sandbank. You must have been very happy here, you and your father. Yes, we were. I used to wake up every morning and think, here I am, exactly where I want to be, and there aren't many boys who can say that. I thought of waking up in those awful English boarding schools with a bell shrilling. He took her outside and showed her his oven, the place where the turtles laid their eggs, the bottle of sugar water that he filled each day for the hummingbirds, just as his father had done. He had 20 different kinds on that one tree, he said. His bow and arrow were hung on a branch, but she had seen a rifle too, propped under the windowsill. Do you see that? He said, pointing to some marks in the sand. That's from an anteater. He comes down at night to drink. His father had planted a simple garden, manok and maize and a few sweet potatoes protected by a wire fence. It's difficult keeping the animals out and keeping it weeded. Looks fine, all of it. She waved her hand over the hut, the boat, lagoon. Looks like a place that one would want to stay forever and ever. He gave her a startled glance. Yes, but I can't stay. I'm going on a journey. Oh, for a moment she was devastated. She had only just met him and now he was going away. I'm going to find the Zanti. She waited. They're my mother's tribe. She was Zanti. My father brought her here. and She died when she was born. I promised him that if anything happened to him, I'd go there. He said they'd keep me safe until I was of age. Then no one could make me go back to Westwood. I thought he was making a fuss, but now that the crows have come. How will you go? In the Arabella's. In the Arabella, as soon as the dry season starts properly. The rivers in the north are still flooded now, but it won't be long. They clambered over the boat together, and it was clear that she was the apple of his eye. She was a steam launch, rakish and sturdy, with a tall copper funnel and an awning running the length of her deck. My father got a cheat from a rubber baron who'd gone bankrupt. She can do five knots when she's in a good mood. Can you manage her on your own? Just about. You have to let a, have a lot of wood chopped at the beginning of the day, and you go on pretty steadily. It'll be difficult because there aren't any reliable maps for the last part of the journey. I'll have to go by what my father remembered. Maya put her hand on the tiller. Five minutes ago, she had wanted to stay in the lagoon forever. Now just as much she wanted to make this journey with Finn. To go up and up on the unknown rivers. Not getting there, just going. But now the dog, who had been following them silently, jumped back ashore and made his way to the door of the hut, which he pushed open with his muzzle. He's telling us it's time for afternoon tea. Maya looked at him to see if he was joking, but he wasn't. Afternoon tea was exactly what Finn now produced. He put on the kettle, warmed the teapot, took down a tea caddy, and measured out three spoonfuls of Earl Grey. Then he found a plate, filled it with biscuits, proper ones with raisins, and put out the sugar tongs in a milk jug. He even handed her a napkin. They might have been in any British drawing room. The dog waited. He only drinks China tea said Finn, putting down a saucer and adding a spoonful of sugar. If you give him anything else, he just looks at you. While they ate and drank, Finn made a polite conversation, asking her how she liked Manus, and whether her friend was still upset about the play. Clovis, do you mean? Yes, he is. But how do you know everything? The native people here, and they tell me. The cleaner in the theater is old Lila's cousin. When they had finished and swelled out the cups, he said, right. Suppose I better explain. I think I might need your help, you see. Maya looked at him, flushed with pleasure. I'll do anything. Just like that, he asked, even though I'm on the run? Yes. Finn grinned. That's what they said that you weren't like the porkers. The porkers? That's what they call the twins. You know, fat little pigs that snuffle and eat. Maya tried to look shocked and failed. Are they as bad as people say, he asked. Maya sighed and stopped trying to be good. Yes, she said. It'd be lovely if they were pigs. One could really get fond of pigs. We'll go outside, said Finn. The mosquitoes are fairly quiet at this hour. So they sat side by side on the wooden deck outside the hut, and Finn told her the story of his father's marriage. When he came out here, my father was just 17. He'd been absolutely wretched in England, but as soon as he came out here, he knew that this was the place for him. At first, he had no money or anything, but he found he could live by collecting plants and berries people needed for medicines and selling them to traders in Manus. He made friends with the native people and learned their languages, and they taught him their skills. For nearly 10 years, he lived like that, exploring the rivers and building his hut. The awful memories of England only bothered him at night when he was dreaming. He was sure that he had gotten away. Finn was silent, looking over the lake. Then one day he went a very long way, not in the Arabella, in the canoe, 
and he fell ill with a fever, one of the really awful ones, and he passed out. When he came round, he was with the Santi. He'd heard of them. They were supposed to be special, very gentle, full of knowledge about healing, but they were very shy and mostly stayed hidden. Not many people had seen them. He said waking up there was like waking up in paradise. The kind, quiet people, the dappled trees. One girl in particular nursed him. Her name was Yara, and he was better than Zanti let her marry him, which was such an honor. He brought her back here, but when I was due to be born, the English doctor wouldn't come out to a native woman in the night, and she died. He paused. After that, I didn't have to do, he didn't have much to do with his own people. He found Lila to nurse me, and we got on all right, though I think he never got over my mother's death. But we were good friends. His voice faltered for a moment. I can stay here and live as he did, fighting medicines and selling stuff to museums. Oh, lots of things. But if he said anyone came for me from England, I was to fight for my life. I was to go back to the Zanti. He never went back himself, but he said the tribe would know me. He turned out his wrist to show her the mark she had noticed in the canoe. The trouble is I've got to get away without being seen, and the crows seem to be everywhere, and no one knows how long they're going to stay and hunt around. The native people won't give me away, but it's a big reward they're offering, and there are people in Manus who are very poor. You said perhaps I could help you. Yes, I've got an idea, but I don't know if it will work. He pulled the dog closer and began to scratch his ear. You don't have to tell me if you don't want to, she said quickly. It isn't that. It isn't that. It's just, uh, I haven't thought of the details yet. Anyway, it doesn't depend on only me. What I'd like to do now is for you to tell me about your friend, Clovis. Where did you meet him? What is he like? So Maya told him about meeting Clovis on the boat, how homesick he was, and how upset he was about his voice breaking. All he wants is to get back to England. He says he's going to stow away. It won't work. They search the boat with a fine tooth comb. People try keep trying to smuggle out rubber seedlings so they can grow them somewhere else, which would kill the rubber trade here. He's sure to be caught. That's what Miss Mitten said. Ah, yes, Miss Mitten. What does she think of Clovis? I think she likes him. Yes, I'm sure she does. He does cry rather a lot, but he's very decent. I suppose he would be if he's your friend. They sat for a while in companionable silence. Then Finn said, you don't happen to know Miss Mitten's Christian name. Maya screwed up her face thinking. She never uses it, but it begins with an A, I think, because she lent me her handkerchief once and there was an A in the corner. Finn nodded. Good, I thought it might be. Fiora's ca canoe now appeared through the reeds and Maya said quickly, what I don't understand is how they can make you go back to Westwood. You're only a child. They don't lock up children in prisons. Finn slapped a mosquito on his arm. They do at Westwood. At Westwood, they lock you up as soon as you are born. That's where we're going to end today. We'll pick up next week with chapter eight. We have been reading Journey to the River Sea by Eva Abotson, pictures by Kevin Hawk, published by Puffin Books. I hope that you've enjoyed this chapter. Once again, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next week. Bye.